So we're talking with uh, Stephen Karpuk. He's running for city council in Kamloops. Um, are there any social justice causes you're personally active in or at least interested in? I've been a Rotarian for 14 years. Um, I'd love to be actually at the food drive right now, but my family's doing that uh, on my behalf as they have for about 10 years now or how long the food bike's been going on. Um, I mean, other than, you know, being very actively involved with Rotary and raising funds for our, our local community. Last year, I brought the musical ride to town as our, our Rotary Club did, and uh, that was a big success. We raised almost $90,000, which we've given back to our community. I think that's the way I choose to get involved. Um, I've got some ideas of how we can sort of maybe address some of those issues going forward, getting to council. Just a matter of getting to the table. Do you support a living wage for all working people? I do, and I believe it's somewhere about 16 to $17, I think, if I recall from uh, some sort of research in last year's discussions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, everyone's entitled to living wage. I pay my staff a living wage in my business, um, and I think it's just out of respect. You know, uh, I think some of the issues that we talk about a living wage can be addressed in how we design our cities, because if everyone's paying all their money to rent and utilities, you got to pay them more to be able to address those needs. Whereas if we built some more affordable homes that were super energy efficient, and we keep those utilities costs down and maybe make them a little smaller so no one's trying to live in a 4,000 square foot home, I think we could probably make those issues come up. Maybe secondary suites. I mean, that's another issue we need to address. Uh, food banks first appeared in Canada in the early 80s and their usage has only increased since then. Why do you think that is? Well, we know there's a gap between the haves and the have nots, so to speak. So until we can address that sort of issue, I think we are, we're going to see just a general trend, but there's also a number of other societal factors I think that's going on. Part of it's, uh, I see it myself, some people don't want to work as hard as some of the people who did before, and, and that's their choice. Uh, we see it across all professions. Um, it's just sort of one of those things. People want more of a work-life balance. And so in that regard, when we've kind of got ourselves conditioned that this is how hard you have to work to get something, and all of a sudden, you don't have that income because you're not working that hard, that might be part of the issue. But again, we can address that at a city level and probably obviously with our federal and provincial partners to see how we can address livability within a community. And every community is different. Vancouver is obviously different than Victoria, Camels, Vernon, Kelowna. So what we deal with here really should be, how do we make it affordable? How do we address, because livability or affordable housing and those types of things, or the fact that people have to then go to a food bank because they can't afford to pay anything other than the rent and the utilities, now they're starving. That's where those issues all come together. And I've got some ideas I think we can make those work. Okay. Uh, what do you think is council's role when faced with epidemics like the fentanyl crisis or the lack of affordable housing? Well, I think it, it comes down to someone's sense of, of hopelessness, right? We need to give these people a sense of hope. So as a council, working with our provincial and federal partners, I mean, maybe it sounds a little bit callous, but I, I totally believe more that it's the provincial and federal responsibilities that are being offloaded onto the municipal backs. And we're not getting the same funding for it. It's not really our responsibility, but it is our job to work with those federal and provincial partners to make this issue addressed, so to speak. Okay. Um, what would you do on council to help eliminate homelessness? Well, again, if you're looking at design, why are we building standard 4,000 square foot homes in Juniper Ridge? What's wrong with doing some micro home developments? What's not, you know, we could maybe in the downtown look at densification. Some people don't like it because it does change the appearance of your city. But who needs to live in 4,000 square feet when maybe 800 or 600? If you look around the world, lots of people are living in 390 square feet. But we don't seem to have that in our psyche, in our design, that that's okay. So we're building mega structures and we're making things that are not efficient. And that really comes back to those people. Can you even find a place to live? So if we're looking at how we can zone flexibility in our city to make it make sense so carriage houses secondary suites that are brought up to code so the people inside are not living in some conditions that are questionable those are issues that we really need to have a hard look at and we can affect those changes here at city level what do you think is a city councillor's job when faced with controversial development projects like ajax well, I think we have a, a say. It's our community, right? If we're neighbors to something like that, we certainly have to have a say. But we also have to respect where the decision-making process lies. And in this case, it's a federal and provincial jurisdiction. I, we may not like it, but that's the way the system is. And we follow the rule of law, so we can make our voices heard. 
I, I think that's okay. Uh, I'd expect that as a community, we would either vote yay or nay or abstained, um, all in favor. But, you know, we, we don't have a say in that right now. Um, and that's just the way the system works. So it's not saying it's a good one, but it is the way it works. So what do you think the role would be as an advocate, though, on City Council? Do you not see there oh, being... Absolutely, uh, we do have a role to advocate, right? We can state our position. We can, but we, there's an issue that we have to look at in the background. If we advocate too hard and a decision goes against a proponent, so to speak, mm -hmm. there is a risk that we could actually be sued. So we have to carefully tread that line and not risk that they lost a project because we were overly advocating one way or the other for or against a project where one side might then come back and say you improperly swayed the process. So recognizing that there is that background litigation issue, we really have to tread carefully. And certainly that was an issue with Ajax. Yeah. What do you think is a reasonable income for a top earner in our society? <laughs> well, you know, I don't give anyone a hard time. Let's say someone creates a, a really cool app for you know technological side and we all decide we want to use it and they charge us 10 cents and suddenly they're a billionaire. Is that a wrong thing? Um, I'm certainly in favor of taxing the rich. I really think they've got all the money and they don't necessarily make all the ideas. Um, often what they do is they take the person who's created the idea, give them a bit of money and then take over the idea. So what's the top? I don't know. Um, I think all, everyone's entitled to those basic necessities of life and I'm a full supporter of that. I just think if somebody's willing to work harder, we shouldn't take and, and, and hammer them into the ground for that initiative because it sort of stifles growth, it stifles in, well, imagination and innovation. So I'm all about those things. I mean, I make probably more than most people as a chiropractor in town, um, but I'm also a believer that you have to give back. So philanthropic and, and a community supporter, be smart about how you put your money. I mean, I haven't taken a vacation overseas in 30 years. And I know a lot of people who are in my practice and they do that on a, on a twice a year basis. I think you have to live within your means and everyone's means are different. Everyone's situation is different. So if we can work a way out that everyone can have a good life, uh, a healthy place to live, food on their table, a good education that can allow them and afford an opportunity to get ahead in life, encourage them with some opportunities and hands up. I think that's where we have to go. What are your thoughts on the current state of public transit and transport infrastructure in Kamloops? Well, I used to be in planning before I was a chiropractor. And so one of the things I always keep an eye on is even in my current day is looking at where do we go? And certainly as we're coming into this council election, uh, it's pretty obvious when you look at the research. The research tells us that if you want to increase your transit usership, you need to increase your service. Service drives demand, it's that simple. So core areas, we need to look at things like a, a 15 minute bus service in our core areas. So no one has to look at a schedule and go, geez, it's gonna be another 27 minutes. They know it's only gonna be maybe 13, 10, eight, whatever. We have a new app that'll tell you when the bus is coming, but the frequency, service drives demand. So I think in our core parts of town and certainly in our outlying areas, I always think that those people out in Hefley and Rayleigh, they kind of get screwed because they don't have bus service that goes late enough for somebody who might have a job in town. The same could be said for Dallas and Barnardvale. So I think we really have to have a hard look at it, put some common sense, talk to the communities and say, hey, if we brought a bus by at seven in the morning to Hefley, circled around, same thing out in Dallas, we brought one that comes by about noon and then one that comes by at eight o'clock, 8.30 at night, you'd certainly catch the full length of the spectrum that most people are working and that might increase our ridership as well. But service drives demand. Uh, what do you hope Kamloops will look like in 20 years? How about 50? Why, why do we only limit it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like the idea I've got a, a picture that I took of the Overlanders Bridge. And, and I look back and our former mayor and, and highways transportation minister, Phil Gillardi, built that bridge. Probably commissioned about 1958 from what I've been able to, to sort of find out and research, but it was completed in 1961. Now, in 1961, the North Shore was not part of our city. It was separate communities of Brocklehurst, Tronkeel, uh, North Shore. We had the Westside Ratepayers Association. Total population over there was about 6,000 people, mm -hmm. but they built a four lane bridge. I can only imagine the ridicule is like, what did you build a bridge to nowhere for? And four lanes at that, but thank God that they had that vision. I, I question with what we have coming along the pipe for our hospital, that we're building something we needed 15 years ago and not looking ahead to what we'll need in 50 years. We need to have that long-term vision. 
as somebody worked in forestry, if we cut down a tree and we had a clear cut, you're looking two cuts ahead. You're looking 250 years out. So when we talk, hey, what's next year's budget in a city or five years and can plan for 20, let's look further ahead and think some of those concepts into place because if we're thinking only short term, you're not going to realize your goals. It's the destination, the route, that are really separate items. Goal, destination, figure out the route and how you're going to get there. So on, on planning, yeah, let's look at 20 years out. What do I see happening? I see a vibrant city. I see a really burgeoning technological sector. A lot of people who have knowledge and experience live here and work somewhere else, either by telecommute or they consult, kind of like the, the picture in Norway. We've got a lot of people who have all these great knowledge, experience, because the government's invested in their people, highly educated, and they live in that country because it's a great place to live. That's what we need to do here. Uh, once elected, what will be your top priority? Are there any burning issues you want to see resolved or addressed? I, I mean, there's a ton of them, right? I mean, certainly we look at our... one. Okay, so let, let's look at downtown. We have an issue where we've got our, our safe injection site, and obviously there's an awful lot of people who live in the area who are not thrilled that it's in their backyard. The same could be said over in the North Shore. That's an issue that's it's right on our doorstep, literally, that we really need to figure out a way with our provincial and federal partners. I had an idea, actually, just the other day of how we might address that, and we've got the old Rayleigh Correctional Site. So we've got some affordable housing, these slow income assisted housing we're building here in town, but perhaps what we need to do is say to those people, we wanna help you up. It's a hand up concept rather than just a free handout. How about you help us help others by we go to the old Rayleigh Correction site, which used to be some of the most productive farmland in our region, turn that site into maybe a rehab center, uh, something where people can then work their hands during the day, right? Let's build a thousand foot row of carrots and potatoes and raspberries. Let's feed our community. Give those people a sense of worth. There's one opportunity to help them figure out that, hey, I'm worth something. Because often they think they're worthless. They have no hope. It's our job as a total community to help this. It's not Ask Wellness. It's not the Salvation Army or the pit stop that happens at the United Church. It's a community that will solve this problem. And that's where part of our role as, as council can come in. Let's start coordinating from that level. Great, thank you. Good luck, Thanks, Peter. Yeah. You take care of yourself.